Somebody said that. Somebody said Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. I'm Terry Khalil. I'm a member of the Detroit Lakes League of Women Voters, which I've been since 2004. I'm also the immediate past president of the League of Women Voters Minnesota and the first outstate president in its 99 year history, um, which has been really fun for seven and a half years of driving back and forth to St. Paul. Um, the League, for those of you who may not know, is a nonpartisan political organization that encur encourages informed and active participation in government works to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Please read more about us in your program and to note the League never endorses candidates or political parties. Thank you all for attending tonight. We'd also like to thank our candidates for participating and we'll introduce them in just a minute. I'd like to thank all the members of the Park Rapids League for welcoming me and for setting this up. And I'd like to acknowledge Luann Herdloff as our timer, right up front and center. <laughs> Wave the red stop sign so they know. Oh yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks to Northwoods Bank, as always, for hosting this event. It's really nice to have a community room like this. A couple housekeeping things. There are some refreshments in the back. And uh, restrooms are located in the hallway to your right, turn left. I think that's the direction, they're back there. Um, let's just go with that. If you would just all please take a second, silence your cell phone, that would be great. The candidates have received ground rules for this event. As audience members, we ask that you remain as quiet as possible so that everyone may hear. We're also video recording. <laughs> Please hold any applause until the forum has ended so candidates can use all the time allotted to answer your questions. The League has determined which questions will be asked from the many that were received via email. And if you've got a question, certainly fill out the card and just hold up your hand and someone will come and collect it from you. We have attempted in good faith to cover areas of interest expressed by the audience. Questions will be screened, similar questions will be consolidated so that as many topics as possible can be addressed. No questions of a personal nature or that are inappropriately hostile or unclear in intent will be asked. It is our goal to have a civil discussion of the issues and to give you information you need when you vote, which you can do anytime from tomorrow until Tuesday, November 6th. You all know about early voting, absentee, early voting, good. I've already said that, so I don't have to say that. Good. With that, um, I'd like to introduce the candidates. For District 2B, Karen Brandon and Steve Green. For District 2A, Matt Russell and Michael Northburn. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. The candidates have two minutes for an opening statement, and Karen, we'll start with you. Okay, so go right ahead when you're ready. Yeah, you two will need to share. You guys are separate. I think we can work it out. It's under Matt's chair there. My time hasn't started yet. No. <laughs> Don't be starting that timer yet. I have You've used up a minute. <laughs> am I waiting or am I starting? Go ahead. Okay, I grew up in a small Minnesota farming community. Um, I grew up poor, but fairly happy because we would go out hunting and fishing around all different parts of Minnesota. Um, I wasn't always treated well because I was poor, and I think that gives me an interesting perspective on the world. Um, I was lucky enough to get into Minnesota State University, Moorhead, and I mean lucky, I was not the best student in high school. But through federal and state investment and loan and working, I was able to get through college and get my four-year degree, and it was that time that I realized that I was a little bit smarter than people treated me before. I was doing okay. 
So I did so well and I loved it so much, I went on to get a master's degree and I was working four jobs and getting my master's degree at the same time, so I'm no stranger to hard work, I guess. Um, at the time I was finishing up my master's degree, I got married to my husband who's here, Dennis Jacobs. Today is our 25th wedding anniversary. Oh. So, this is great. Um, I don't know, where is he? <laughs> When I was working on my master's degree, my mother became ill, and I used to help her figure out her medications. And as some months, my parents couldn't afford her medications, and they would have to call the pharmacist and ask the pharmacist, you know, which ones can we give up this month? And I didn't have enough money, and I felt, I felt pretty helpless. So I think there's some shared values that I've heard all around the district. When somebody asked me to run, it was actually Kathy Coyle. She's my campaign manager. She's right here. She asked me to run, I said no, and then she, she said, think about it. So I started talking to my friends and my family, and my friends said, yes, you should run, you bring people together, but my father had the largest impact on me. He passed away in July, but he told me to run because you're gonna win and you're gonna make good change, and so that's our motto, we're gonna win. And I will with your vote, thank you. Thank you. Uh, once again, that you please hold your applause till the end. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Steve, go ahead. Well, I am Steve Green. I've served in the legislature for the last six years. We've made uh, some pretty good progress. I just heard today that uh, some of the reforms that we made within the insurance industry or are, are, are MNSURE uh, will see anywhere from 7.4 on the low end to 27.7% reduction in insurance premiums. And so, you know, we're moving forward, things are, things are looking pretty good. I have uh, been a lifelong member to Northern Minnesota, or resident of, life of Northern Minnesota. Born in Minoman County, uh, on a, actually grew up on the same place my dad did and, and uh, raised my children there, and now my son has that same place. My wife Cindy and I, in February, will be married for 40 years. We have six kids and soon to be 14 grandkids, and so, the future of Minnesota is very important to me. The freedoms that we've enjoyed across this, this country and this state, very, very important to me. Uh, we don't always, uh, you know, we have to work for what we get. We don't always get everything we, we want, but in this country we have an opportunity to work for that and to strive to get ahead, whereas in other countries they don't have that. And, and I want to see that uh, my grandkids and, and my children and grandkids have that same opportunity. And so that's uh, kind of where we're sitting now. Uh, when uh, my wife and I were married not too long out of high school, maybe almost a year, and uh, we, uh, I went to school at the Detroit Lakes uh, ABTI. It wasn't a college then, it was an institution, but our institute. But um, then we uh, got caught up in the Carter economy, and we ended up uh, back home, and we went into the greenhouse business with my parents, and we did that for about 30 years. And then uh, from then on, I, I've done carpenter work, like contracting, and now I am a, a legislator. I think my time is up. Thank you, Steve. Next, we'll turn to District 2A, Matt Russell. Good evening, and thank you for everyone for being here. And uh, thank you for our uh, kind hostess for uh, keeping us all in line. And thank you for the women voters for uh, putting us together. I don't think it's on. It's not on. Yeah. How about now? Yeah. That's on. Sorry. Can we start over? No. Could you hear that much at least yeah. anyway? Yeah. Thank yeah. you for everybody everybody for being here. Uh, my name is Matt Grossel and uh, currently you're uh, legislator in District 2A. I've been in the House for two years and uh, 2016 was the first time I ran for any sort of political office ever. I just, uh, myself, I got sick of politics as usual. And I thought I'd try to go there to make a difference, to make sure that uh, the folks in outstate Minnesota, the folks in our district, in north central Minnesota, voices were heard. Um, why I ran for office? Well, I just made one point. I had been out of circulation for a while. Um, my family is, uh, uh, has a history of service, uh, hearts of service, right down to my uh, children. One's a nurse, the other two have served in the military, one's in law enforcement. The other one is still continuing her education to go into human services. So they have hearts for service, hearts for giving, to help people. That's why I got into politics. I did the same uh, as I served in law enforcement. That was my reason for being there, was to help people. 
to make it a better place for our families to, to live, for you to raise your children, for you to feel safe at home, and for you to be able to exercise your freedoms. That's why, that's why I ran. Um, in St. Paul, you know, we serve our communities back home, and that's one thing I try to make sure and uh, get across to everyone. We are here to serve. We're not here for a pat on the back. We're not here for self-serving interests. We are here to represent the folks back home. You know, and I love hearing from everybody. I love uh, having communication with the constituents back home. I learned one thing in law enforcement, that if they don't see your face, how do they know you really care? Or if they don't hear your voice? If you're not willing to take the time to listen to people, why should they, why should they support you? I love hearing from people. I love getting out to meet people and talking to them so that I can hear what's going on back home and then we can hear, represent your voices down in the state legislature. Thank you. Thank you, Matt Russell. Michael Northburg. Uh, Bonjour. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Northburg. I'm a candidate for District 2A. I, uh, I am... Um, a uh, member of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe, enrolled in Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe, and I'm a direct descendant of the Red Lake Nation. Um, my, my concerns and, and, and roots here in my district and the area we're in right now are, are inherent. Um, my family's history predates the state of Minnesota, predates the United States itself, right here where we're standing. And so these issues that, um, that we have in, in my district and, and as well as others around it um, are very important to me. And the reason why I got into, uh, into this running and this race is because people asked me to. Um, I believe that if you're going to become a representative of the people, that the people should want you to be a representative. And so um, at the beginning of this year, um, I finally accepted that challenge, even though people have been asking me for the last decade to do so. Um, the opportunity was just never right. So what, uh, what, what held me back before was the fact that I'm a single parent, um, father of my daughter, she just turned 18 a couple weeks ago, and uh, I was also raised by my grandpa, who I took care of until his passing four years ago. So the, the responsibilities that I had um, that weighed on me and my decisions to not run it previously uh, kind of freed me up this year when I got asked again by the people to be their representative. So um, with that, uh, I just want to Appreciate everybody being up here today and appreciate all of you being out there. And I look forward to the rest of the forum and I'll let us get on with that. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We've got quite a stack of questions here. I'll ask your patience as we go through them. The candidates have one minute to answer these. Um, so you have to be succinct. And the first question, um, we rotate the order in which everyone responds. It's a randomized chart. Um, so I'll try at the beginning of each question to tell you who's going first. And in this case, Steve, you'll go first, followed by Matt Grosso. And the question is interesting because it has to do with omnibus bills, which the St. Paul Pioneer Press today has an editorial about. And given that we have two young ladies in the back, I'd like to read you the St. Paul Pioneer Press's definition of an omnibus bill. They have broad subjects like education and transportation, and contain everything from soup to nuts to swapped horses and magic cloaks of, of unaccountability. It goes on to describe thousand page bundles of appropriations and decisions that drop on the laps of bleary eyed legislators in the last frenzy, frenzied moments of the legislative session. Sound familiar? So the question against that definition is. What can we do to change that? And do you support the single subject clause in the Constitution? Well, again, we'll start with Steve and followed by Matt. Go ahead. Yeah, I've never liked omnibus bills. Uh, right now, we are stuck with them until we can uh, make some changes, I guess. There's only one reason to have an omnibus bill, in my opinion, and I voice that all the time, and that is if you have a pot of money in one certain subject, only in that subject, and you have to disperse that money out to different things based on uh, how much money is there, and uh, how many uh, places that money has to go. Uh, so I probably don't even need the whole the whole uh, minute to answer this, which is I uh, I would support uh, bills going through on their own. There's a lot of things in 
in St. Paul that uh, have been going on there for a long time. And as you know, uh, government moves pretty slow, but we're working on it. And I do, uh, I do think that that's an issue where we have to move forward. Great, thank you very much. Matt, you're next, followed by Michael. As far as the omnibus bills go, um, I would like to see them trimmed down to uh, handle the necessities, handle the state assets, the roads and bridges, the uh, infrastructure type things, and uh, for uh, assets such as uh, schools, colleges, the stuff that the state is responsible for. There's plenty of other uh, funds available for, for other, uh, uh, other projects that aren't state assets, that don't, that aren't what, we, what I consider necessities for our uh, state. Some of the things that uh, this, this pass out of this bill helped was uh, one just got news today that uh, there were several schools in my district that received the uh, school safety funding, school safety grants. Red Lake, um, Cass Lake Bino, which we have some constituents from our district that go to Cass Lake Bino, and also Bagley. They receive funds, that's the school safety funding that we put in the omnibus bill. So the omnibus bills do serve a purpose to be used right. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, uh, Michael. Um, <clears throat> so I believe what we can do to, to change the issue is to do exactly what the second part of the question was, is to follow the Constitution. So um, that is a very simple answer to that one is I definitely support following the Constitution and that's going to correct the mistakes that have been made over the last couple of years that I'm aware of uh, when I've been paying attention to what the omnibus bill represents. Thank you very much. Karen. I agree. I think um, um, omnibus bills are used um, for sneaky politics. I think they're used for extreme party politics and I think we should trim it down to what the Constitution says and slim it down. I think that we have to be careful in anything that we do because government is slow and people's problems are not slow, they're fast. And so we need to find a way, if we're gonna do that, to make sure that our process also speeds up in other ways because just making it one issue for each bill isn't gonna speed us up any. So we're gonna have to make sure we're doing something else as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is on the environment and uh, Matt, you're first, followed by Michael. Our natural environment is very important to voters in these districts. What are your plans for prioritizing the environment? And how can we get various groups, like farmers, industry, etc., to work together on this? Matt? The environment is very important. And it's very important to all Minnesotans, as far as I've heard. And from everybody that I've spoken to, it, that is one of their uh, issues. Uh, right from the resort owners, businesses, to people that are, can consider themselves hardcore environmentalists. Uh, the industries, such as, okay, I'll, I'll talk about pipeline. The industries, and I'll talk about the electric industry, the coal. They have met and exceeded, they have met and exceeded the regulations and uh, the regulations that we put on them to make sure that they are keeping things clean. So to mandate more on them when they're already exceeding this, you know what, I, it, it uh, boils down to it's gonna go down to the, the customer that's gonna start paying for these mandates. So if they're doing their job, they're doing what we've asked them to, and going above and beyond, then I think we should let them work for a while without putting more mandates on them. The environment, the environment is, is uh, very important. Thank you, Matt. <coughs> Next we'll hear from Michael, followed by Karen. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Our natural environment is very important to voters in this district. What are your plans for prioritizing the environment? How can we get various groups like farmers and industry to work together on this? Um, so I've been uh, an environmental program manager for almost nine years. Um, I work under federal grants from the US EPA. And um, one of the things that, that I know that, that I do in my job every day is follow the law. Um, local laws, state laws, and federal laws. And on top of that, because I work for the tribe and I'm a tribal member, tribal laws. And um, that's one of the things that I think um, people tend to forget, that, that there's laws that are designed for these exact reasons in order to ensure that, ensure that we have an environment 
for not only our future, but our children's future, and our children's children's future. Um, to, to make a quick point, um, I, I hope everybody already knows this, that Minnesota is a non-oil producing state. So um, when, when, when people talk about supporting a, an oil company, uh, and a foreign oil company at that, I have no problem putting mandates on them to ensure that our state is going to be there for our future children. Thank you, Michael. Karen. I live in a sustainable home. I have solar panels. I have um, uh, super insulation. I have geothermal. I, I sort of walk the walk when it comes to protecting the environment because I think it's our responsibility to do so for our future generations. So I have some good, solid plans for ways to protect the environment here in Minnesota. Remember, I grew up poor. And so, you know, the public spaces in Minnesota, for me and many of my colleagues, friends, constituents, that's how we were able to experience the environment. And the environment provides us resources and um, our future living. So talking about alternative energy sources, renewable energy sources, the thing that we have to do to bring people together is remember that we're more alike than we're different. We're more alike than we're different. And we need to focus on that and focus on transitioning and not shocking these places, but talking about how do we move into the future in a way that does not take choices away from our children and our grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. Steve? Thank you. Um, the question kind of leads us to believe that we're not working with farmers or industry, and that's simply not true. We are. Uh, we, we asked the farmers to cut back on nitrogen, and they did. And we're seeing the benefits of it. We've asked industry to make certain uh, changes in the, in the way they do business, and they have, and we're seeing the effects of it. Uh, I get reports all the time. Uh, most people don't under, know this, that the Red River of the North is cleaner than it's been in 40 years. And so the policies that are in place are working. And so to, to put more demands on uh, over the top of those, we're seeing the effects of that as well. We're seeing it in, in our uh, public utilities within our cities and how the rates are going up. I grew up poor too, by the way, Karen. Probably even poorer than you. <laughs> but but, that's, but, the, but that, that's what I'm just going to say. It's not a competition. Exactly. It's, it's, it's the way things are in, we're in northern Minnesota. I, everybody around me was the same. But I talked to a lot of people today also on fixed incomes who can't pay their electric bills or can't pay their heating bills. Thank you. Our next question, Michael, will go first, followed by Karen, and we're going to stay with the environment, specifically clean water. Clean water is essential to the economy, the environment, and our health. What proposals can be enforced or enacted to keep our water clean and safe? What proposals can be enforced or enacted to keep our water clean and safe? Michael. Oh, well, first of all, we need to enforce the laws that have already been on the books for decades. Um, that's something that uh, has been tried to has been tried to have circumvented recently. And I think that um, you know the main thing that we can do is ensure that we have a high water quality standard, and that um, we take advantage of opportunities to increase our cleanliness, not um, decrease it. Um, I like the point that was made about uh, a river being the cleanest it's been in 40 years. I wonder if it has to do with the uh, development of our environmental laws. So with that, that's the answer to my question. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Karen, followed by Steve. We know a lot about water, and we know a lot about how to clean water. And we also know a lot about how water becomes unclean. So we just need to follow the processes that we know and not let them get too political and not let them get to the point where people who are in vulnerable situations will make choices about water that they wouldn't make if they weren't vulnerable. And by what I mean by that is there are people in our communities who, who are struggling. A lot of people in our communities are just treading water, so to speak, economically. And so if we want to keep our water clean and safe and our environment safe and plan for our future, we have to keep our economy strong. And that's a big issue and it's a separate one, and I know I don't have time to get into that. But that's how we have to keep water clean. Thank you, Steve. Uh, there again, we're, we're monitoring the water all the time. And if there are problems, the MPCA or DNR, whoever it is, has the ability to cut off water permits to any industry out there at any time, anywhere, if they, if they see a problem. 
So there are policies in place. So to believe that there's nothing out there is, is just not true. And, and so, like I said, when I'm in session, it's harder now when, when I'm not, but when I'm in session, I get updates on, on this area through the MPCA and, and what they put out every month because they do, they do their testing and they put out a chart every month. So it, uh, it, comes to my, it comes to my office and I look through it. And things aren't as bad as you say. There are always areas at any given time that, that will pop up. I'm not gonna say there's not. But there are policies in place where the agencies have the ability to go in and attack those before they get too bad. Okay, thank you. Our next question is on... Oh, I'm sorry, Matt. <laughs> no. I said earlier today, I do this once a form, I overlook something. I apologize, Matt. Go ahead. No apology necessary. Um, Steve mentioned the, the red. I'll mention the Mississippi. The Mississippi in Minnesota has got the cleanest waters in the nation. We've got the most pristine waters in the headwaters down down. Now that's that's because the state, the environmentalists, the farmers, the industries, they're working together, as Steve mentioned before as well. They're working together to try to make sure that the waters are kept clean. Bonnie tour last summer. I was out and visited many small communities. They're being, uh, they're being forced to consider million dollar, millions of dollar uh, upgrades on their, their water treatment systems, their sewage systems. Millions of dollars they don't have. And you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very hard to, to look at that and consider that they've got to try to struggle, they've got to raise taxes, they've got to do all these other things to raise that money when they're putting clean water, cleaner water back into the rivers and they're taken out. Great, thank you. And the next question, we'll start with Karen and we're gonna go straight down the road. And the first part is a yes or no part. Do you accept the reality of human-caused global climate change that we see in Minnesota with record-breaking rains and storms? Second part is, what can be done in the legislature to mitigate these effects? Do you accept the reality of human-caused global climate change? Second part, what can be done to mitigate the effects? Yes, I do. <laughs> like 99% of scientists who actually study it, and the Pentagon, and the Security Council, who all have put out reports for years and years about how that is actually something that we have to watch out for because it could influence the state of security in the United States. What can we do? Well, again, um, we have to monitor and look at the local level. How many people know how many fish can a child eat out of a lake in Minnesota up per month? Anybody know that? It's one, so don't eat more than one. And you probably know why, because of what? Mercury, Mercury which comes from coal. coal. So you don't even have to talk about this massive global climate change to talk about things that are affecting our communities right now and to know that there are things that we can do about it. So we can look at energy sources that do not pollute our lakes and look at transitions to get to those energy sources. So yes, and there's much that we can do if we stick to looking and understanding our local environments. Thank you. Thank you. Here and Steve. The amount that uh, humans contribute to any global warming is minute. And uh, as I'm looking at, uh, if, as, I'm, as I'm looking at the charts and what I'm hearing is that the globe has actually been uh, cooling since about 1995, and it does go up and down. And I also know from, from studying that you could get uh, more pollution and more blackout from, from one volcano than what humans have put on the earth since, the, since they've been walking the earth. And yet, it, it, it cleans itself. So I don't think that, uh, I, I think that the global warming uh, has been put forward as a scare tactic. And I just don't think that there's anything that we're going to be able to do that, that the Earth can't do itself in, uh, in either uh, cooling or warming the globe. Thank you. Matt? No. And uh, just very, very short, you can't control what God is going to do with his green Earth. Oh. Okay, thank you. Michael? Uh, yes, 
And um, so we have climate history dating back millions of years. And one of the things we know about that climate history is that uh, over our, our last uh, 100 years or so during our industrial age is we have exacerbated that heating and cooling. Yes, the world uh, heats and cools naturally on its own, um, but one of the things that we're seeing with our scientific data by hundreds of thousands of people around the world is that it's being exacerbated at levels unbefore seen on this planet. Thank you, Michael. Our next question will begin with Steve, followed by Matt. The question is, given the importance of a full range of educational opportunities to provide increased employees to the area, what can the legislature do to support job training and apprenticeships at the high school level? We are doing it. Uh, it is, it's an extremely important, and we're seeing uh, through the efforts that we've put forth in the last few years, more trades back in our high schools. Uh, we're looking at more money into our vocational schools, but the, the trades in the high schools are just extremely, extremely important. I think, the, you know, I've talked to law enforcement, talked to uh, school districts, and some of the things that we've been discussing is that if we can get the kids interested who are not now interested in school, get them interested in a trade, not only can we keep them in school, we might be able to keep them out of trouble. And, not, and then prepare them for, or give them a, a real big boost in preparedness for when they are out of high school, they might be ready for the job as they come out of high school, or if they decide to go on to either two or four year college, everything that they've learned in that technical training will see them forward. And if you go around and visit the school, you'll see that those things are coming back, and we need to continue to work on that and make sure that they have the funding they need to get into the technical part of the training. Thank you, Steve. Matt and Michael will follow Matt. And I'll just follow that uh, up for what Steve said. And we also have partnerships between local industries, local businesses, and the schools to take kids, and they can do work-study programs at these industries. And those are some things that the schools, the uh, superintendents, have been kicking around. Now, uh, we've got the, a couple that I believe are in, in uh, use right now in my district, but I'd have to confirm that for sure because I have talked to the superintendents and they had mentioned some of the industries and starting these partnerships with them. So it's, uh, it, it is very important. These, these jobs are out there. We have the carpenters, the carpenters trades, we have the welders, we have the machine operators trades, all of whom, all of whom, uh, I'll just put a plug in here, all these unions have endorsed my campaign. So I'm just gonna keep going and helping bring these trades back to our schools because there's a lot of kids getting skipped over they're getting missed when they should be gearing to some of their education towards the trades. Thank you. Michael. Um, so they both make great points, and um, both points that I agree with that uh, we need to increase that in the school systems. Um, but one of the things that we also need to do is ensure that the opportunities are there once they get out of the school. Um, so um, post K through 12 education uh, and funding for that education as well. So um, it's one thing to get uh, that kind of experience and education in high school, but that ain't really gonna make much of a difference once you get out of high school if you don't have some kind of access to that uh, uh, quality opportunity. Thank you, Karen. Well, you can pretty much be assured that no matter who of us gets elected in, education's gonna do well in this area because we all, <laughs> look at that, we all agree, you know, that this is not only happening and that we need to improve upon it. When I was the dean at the White Earth Tribal Community College, one of the issues we came up against was young native men in particular getting pushed out of school. And so we had our English teacher go and teach English at the high school, at the college level. And there's something called post-secondary enrollment option. And a lot of colleges put a high GPA requirement on that, but you don't have to. And so we took the students from the college and brought them, or from the high school and brought them to the college halfway through. And some of the boys and a couple of the girls who were going to drop out stayed in school because we developed this program for them and showed them that not only trades, but other types of courses that they could get ahead on before they graduated from high school. The funding issue for high schools is that if you do the post-secondary enrollment option, the funding follows the student. And so for high schools, that does create a problem. So when Steve brought up that, you know, the funding needs to really be looked at, that's one of the issues that we really need to look at to make sure that that program is solid and continues to work. 
All right, thank you, Karen. Our next question will start with Matt, followed by Michael. There are many divides within the legislature, urban versus rural, business versus consumers, as well as the obvious political one. What do you see as the working environment in the legislature now, and how can it be improved in order to solve problems for Minnesota? You know, my two years in the legislature, um, I've always been willing to work with anybody. My door has always been open to everybody in the district. And I've worked across the aisle with, with the DFL on my uh, nurses bill. It's a, a, a bill that would help to protect nurses and medical personnel in the hospitals, firefighters and EMTs while they're performing their duties. So I've already started working with, other, with, uh, with uh, the DFL. Uh, a lot of my other legislation, if you take a look at it, you'll see that these are nonpartisan issues. Child pornography, making school buses safer, safer so that predatory offenders aren't driving school buses, going and uh, working on the, the crim sex bill to make sure that it is representing the victims, taking care of the victims and not being a uh, soft landing for the, the predators. So if you, uh, I might have, well, I know I've got some bills that would probably be, be considered right. But I work right down the middle with a lot of my with a lot of my legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Michael, and then Karen, you'll follow Michael. Um, so, you know, one of the things that people have talked to me about when they asked me to to run and represent them was um, just for going down to the Capitol and um, advocating for fairness. Now, one of the things that that different, differentiate the urban and the rural population is exactly that population. And so um, when we talk about uh, uh, fairness, um, you know, we, we, we in, uh, in rural Minnesota, um, we, we like our spaces, you know, we, we like our little small towns, um, we stand behind them, we stand behind the people that make, up, make them up, and, um, and we, I, I think we are a more tighter knit community than people are in urban areas. So um, the, the way that, you know, I, I've thought about this question is that, um, where you have a, a disproportionate circumstance based on population, then we need to remove that aspect of making determinations as to what fairness is. And once we do that, we can move forward together. Thank you, Michael. Karen. Well, I think we're in a, there goes my name. <laughs> People know who I am. Um, I think we're in this place in time when we have extreme party politics that are hurting those politicians who are in the middle. And we need to be voting in people who are more middle ground. People who understand that we're more alike than we're different. People who understand that it's the middle ground that pulls us forward, not the extreme party politics. Extreme party politics are toxic. And so I am a person and people asked me to run because I tend to pull people together. It doesn't mean I'm going to throw everything away. And that's what it takes. It takes sitting down and working with people and remembering there's good in everybody. And again, we're more alike than we're different. And that's where we start. There's not one issue that we don't have common ground on. And that's where we always need to start. Thank you. Thank you. Steve? I think if you, if you look at, uh, if, if you're really bored and want to watch the legislature, <laughs> and action, you'll see that there's many, many, many times where that board lights up all green. Or, or very bipartisan. Uh, it doesn't make the news most of the time because no one wants to hear the legislature got along today. Uh, we work across the aisles all the time. And I think that uh, unfortunately there are some issues that become very political and the, the, the party who is, has the majority rules. And so uh, games are played with the, trying to get the majority but there, there's so many issues that we do agree on. And when you sit down across the table uh, from someone on the other side of the party, which we do, they, um, you'd, be, you'd be really surprised at how much we do agree on. And, and like I said, look at it sometime, watch sometime, and watch how that board lights up on a lot of these bills that you never hear about because they're not controversial. Thank you. For our next question, we'll start with Michael and then go to Karen. This is going to stay on the topic of the divide but it's a little different twist. As a legislator or potential legislator, 
what, if any, responsibility do you feel you have to bring citizens closer together? As a legislator, what, if any, responsibility do you feel you have to bring citizens closer together? Michael. Well, I think what we need to do is um, maintain our, uh, uh, our history of being known as Minnesota nice. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we all care about each other and we care about one another. And um, it doesn't matter what our differences are, that at the end of the day, we're all Minnesotans. And I think that's one of the things that um, will help continue to keep us unified as a state and um, be able to um, knock down the dividing walls that are created by, by others. Thank you. Karen? It is our most important responsibility to bring citizens together. That's the whole point. Um, you know, Steve talked about freedom. You don't have freedom if people aren't together. You know, Matt talked about his best part of his work is bringing people together. Um, Michael talks about being Native, and I'm part of Ojibwe as well, and we talk about the history and how important it is for the history but that we're all together today. You hear how Michael doesn't talk about Natives being separate from other people. It's the sole responsibility of us to bring people together. That's why they call us we the people. And I firmly believe in that, and that's why people ask me to run, because that's what I want to do. Thank you. Steve? I don't know if it's the, the responsibility of a legislator to bring people together, but I do try to do that. I. Uh, Responsibility as a legislator is to take care of the bills of the state and then hopefully go home before you do any damage. But, um, but the, you know, working together uh, in the community is, is, where, is where we need to get, to, get together. That, that's the important thing. And I do do that. And I also am a member of the White Earth Nation and I work with the tribe. And it's, uh, um, it's sometimes difficult, but more and more people understand that the issues of one community are exactly the same. Everybody wants a better future. Every, everybody loves their children. Everybody gets up every morning and wants, and wants to work for a better future, for not only for that day, but for, for moving ahead. And I think when uh, uh, more and more we're getting there, well, one day I hope to see that uh, everybody's going to realize that, that, there, that there's not a difference. So. Thank you. Matt? You know, I, I, I mirror Steve's to, to the degree that, uh, you know, I, I don't believe it is our responsibility to bring people together, though you try to do that. <coughs> I, I've always, I always have my door open to anyone, and they know that, and we should make that clear. Um, bringing people together, that starts at home. That starts at home with all of us, to teach our kids honor and respect, to teach them how to treat one another. To do, to do to others what you would have others do to you. Okay. One other, one other way that we try to uh, bring people together down at the Capitol is that we have a prayer caucus. We have uh, prayer meetings. We invite everybody to join us. Anybody is welcome. That's a way to bring people together. And, you know, I continually pray for wisdom, for words, the right words, the right wisdom, to make the best decisions possible for our state, for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. For our next question, we're going to start with Karen, and again, we'll go straight down the road. We're going to turn to the local economy. Participation in a large variety of outdoor recreational sports is increasing and provides much needed tourism dollars to the district. What will you do to promote tourism within the district? Is there anything that can be done to increase tourism in winter? What can you do to increase tourism dollars to the district? What can we do to promote it? And what can we do about the winters? <laughs> That's not really a question. <laughs> uh, well, in 2008, the people of Minnesota uh, showed their passion and support and love for the environment, and they voted for legacy funding. Uh, Three-eighths of one percent of tax. So um, we have that. We have to protect that. We have to make sure that we're valuing what the people in the state of Minnesota have, have said they wanted. 
And we need to tap into our tourism more. You know, people don't know this, but 500,000 people visit Itasca State Park in our district, not in theirs, in ours. Um, 500,000 people, we could tap into them some more. And winners, I mean, I think we should be advertising that by saying only the strong come here in the winter. <laughs> but we love our outdoors, we need to support our tourism, and we need to keep moving that way as Minnesotans. That's a strong part of who we are and our identities and almost everybody I talk to. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Tourism is important, and most people don't know that Minnesota has lost uh, over 2,000 resorts since the 1970s. Now over for over regulation. Uh, I like tourism. I like winters, but uh, but as far as the local economy, uh, it it does help us in the summertime, but it does leave us lax in the wintertime. And what I'd like to see us do is promote more families in the area. I was uh, looking at some statistics today, even on how we are getting more and more young families wanting to move back to Greater Minnesota. And I can tell you that a family of four living in your community, supporting your schools and supporting your stores, will replace a whole lot of people who come here for tourism. And it sounds like I'm against tourism, I'm not. I want to see our resorts thrive. I think that they're great, this is a great place. But let's not forget our families as well. If you want to, if you want to improve the local economy, let's continue to work for jobs and for people to move here, raise their family in what I believe is the best part of the world. Thank you, Steve. Matt? Well, Steve stole part of my part of my thunder there, and that was for the resorts. Um, but I'll just uh, keep going with that. The resorts uh, need those uh, those winter dollars as well, so to relieve some of the burden off of them as far as the regulations, uh, to stop stop putting more on them. And when they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, why do we keep mandating more and more and more from them? It's pretty soon, like you said, two thousand are gone. We have very few left. As far as uh, some of the, I think the question was probably asked by somebody who owns a snowmobile or skis. Um, we can't control the snow. Wish we could, but we can't. And I know snowmobiling and uh, outdoor activities such as skiing are very important. We have some of the best trails, trail systems in the nation. And, you know, to see those more active, to, uh, to see uh, good snows so that they, they can have good trails to, to ride on. Uh, that'll bring that'll bring business uh, to any number of uh, community, the restaurants, bars, etc., and resorts. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so, a lot of great stuff was said, and um, I, I agree with most, if not all, of it. But I think, in addition to to that, would be that um, we need to make it more attractive for for small businesses to be here. Uh, and, and maintain themselves over the winter time um, in order to have something and some place for people to do. Um, I, uh, I've been to a, a little place called Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And, <laughs> oh, some of you know. Uh, it is uh, an, an incredibly expensive little town in the edge of the mountains, um, just south of the Grand Tetons. Um, they don't seem to have an issue with uh, winter tourism. Um, they're actually thriving and I think a lot of that has to do with uh, their growth and their growth with their businesses and their growth with attracting people to come there because there's something to do. So um, with everything else that was said on here, that's what I have to add to that. Thank you. We're going to stay with the economy. Steve, you'll be first followed by Matt. Surveys show that the arts, theater, music, etc. contribute to our economy. What can you do to support the arts in our area? What can you do to support the arts in this area? Well, I think the arts pretty much support themselves in this area. Uh, so if your question is, is probably going to be leaning toward legacy, we must well get it over with right now. Um, I, mean, I watch the legacy funds very closely. And there's a lot of money that's spent uh, through legacy that I consider to be wasted. And uh, so some of the things that I've done is to go after some of the waste. Now, I take a lot of heat from that because there's good projects in Legacy as well. But uh, just in, uh, in one portion of the arts, because you brought that up, although, although there's a lot of waste all through Legacy, uh, we're giving out grants to people so that they can buy uh, personal laptops, so that they can buy computers. We have people taking uh, trips to the Caribbean at $10,000 worth of Legacy money uh, to do projects that when, when the legacy money was supposed to be
for Minnesota. And so these are things that come across my desk, and they're not just a few. Uh, I guess I'm already done. <laughs> Thank you, Matt, followed by Michael. Just to follow that up, uh, to finish that, there's things that uh, are appropriate and should be funded. The arts are one of them. And uh, I've, I've in the past uh, helped support that when it, when it has come across, and I believe it was in our, our bonding. Um, so, you know, there, there are things that, that uh, will continue, I'll continue to support, but as Steve was saying, there are things that, uh, my goodness, why should we be wasting state dollars on these types of things? You could use those dollars for things that are more deserving of it and, and more needed. Thank you. Michael. Uh, well, I don't know the specific background to the Caribbean story, but um, I do know that there are some amazing things that can be done with today's technology, and that would include computers, um, tablets, and things of that nature. Um, and so I, I also think that uh, part of what I was talking about earlier about uh, creating um, things for people to do, when I was younger, um, I was in an accelerated youth program, and one of the things we did was, was go throughout the state of Minnesota, mainly the northern half of the state, from Grand Forks over to Duluth, and um, take part in, in the arts, uh, whether it was plays or musicals or orchestras. And, and I think that that's uh, something that will really help us, is um, ensuring that these dollars that they're talking about go to the things that they're designated for. Thank you. Karen? Well, I think um, for me, I know that I was just looking at some research by the Minnesota Historical Society. Somebody sent me this, and that for every dollar of legacy money spent in this area, we get $2 back in economy. So it's a good way to grow, especially local small town economies. Now, if there's a misappropriation of funds, that's different than waste. And if somebody's taking money and using it for something that they're not supposed to, then we should go after them. But, but if, you know, the idea of waste is subjective, but within the framework of the legacy, I'm sure there's a framework for what you can and cannot spend this money on. And I guess I haven't heard any of that, but if there is some misappropriation of funds, those people should be um, held accountable. But for me, I'm gonna honor that voice of Minnesotans and I'm gonna look at a system that's working. It's working, it's doing what it's supposed to do, and it's bringing us um, art and that spirit and that framework and that passion that we know all Minnesotans have. We have artists here and we want them to shine in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will begin with Matt, followed by Michael. As a small business which operates out of my home, I was recent. Uh, let me try that again. As a small business operating out of my home, I was adversely impacted by the recent tax bill, which reduced how much interest I could deduct from income taxes. How would you propose to make things more fair in Minnesota for small businesses? Let me repeat some of that. I was adversely impacted by the recent tax bill, which reduced how much interest I could deduct from income taxes. How would you propose to make things more fair in Minnesota for small businesses? Matt. Well, we've helped businesses, you know, with the, uh, with the tax breaks on uh, the, uh, I believe it was the first $250,000 of, of uh, their value. Now, with the, with the small business in the home, um, our tax bill, which was vetoed, vetoed by the governor, complied with the, complied with the federal tax changes. And what we can do is, once we get back into session, we can get our tax pro program passed so that we get into compliance, so that we are holding so I believe it was 90% of Minnesotans harmless. Thank you, Michael. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. I'm trying to figure out where to start. <laughs> How would you propose to make things more fair in Minnesota for small businesses with regard to taxes? So, um, and, and, I, and I do recall part of the question was somebody having their own home business. Um, I guess I would consider them like self-employed. Um, I think um, people under a threshold uh, even smaller than that, there should be a tax bracket for them that exempts them from um, these types of situations, especially that, that harm them in the way this person is concerned about. 
Um, uh, one of the things that uh, that really are, are really stand out to me is that uh, when you talk about small businesses and their um, their their wages compared to large businesses and their wages, um, I don't think we do enough for small businesses to ensure that they can maintain their businesses, maintain their lifestyles, and maintain uh, the livable wages for their employees. So that's definitely something I think we need to work on as well. Thank you, Karen. Well, I think we have to have a fair tax system. And a fair tax system, um, you know, people who make more money pay a certain percentage of tax, and people who make less money pay less of a percentage of tax. And if people who are making less money are able to have more money in their hands, our small businesses in our communities do better. We know that when people have money and they spend it locally, our small businesses do better. So we need to protect that whole process, that whole idea. Now, I'll be honest with you, taxes is something I'm not as good at, and I'm not afraid to say this isn't my best topic, and I'm not afraid to say if I'm wrong, and I'm not afraid to change my mind if I have new information. But it seems to me that if we can't tax fairly, we've lost everything. And fairly means our individuals, our small towns, our small businesses are given at least a fair shake, if not somewhat of an advantage in the deal. Now, another part of that is that small businesses, when they do get that tax break, shouldn't be seen as places where they're responsible now to pay, hire a whole bunch of people and be the answer to our unemployment and underemployment. That's another issue. We'll talk about that later. Thank you. Steve. I will never be able to explain the tax code uh, in, the, in a minute, but uh, what happened was um, when they did the tax changes, there was a few states that got hurt by it. Most of them saw a reduction. Minnesota, because it's a high tax state, and because of the way we, uh, the Minnesota revenue complies with the federal government, uh, what, and on a federal level, they, they expanded how many, you know, the, the amount that can be taxed. They expanded the people that can be taxed to a broader uh, uh, area, but then they reduced the re uh, dependence. And so, because Minnesota uh, is high tax and just went with the federal income instead of Minnesota income, that's why Minnesotans are gonna get hurt. And we did have the tax conformity bill, so it's more than just conforming, it's also changing some of the codes within Minnesota to allow those deductions back in. And, and I think we can get there, and it's important that we do it immediately when we go back into session, because people aren't gonna be able to know how to file their taxes. So, and small businesses are gonna get hurt more than anybody, because they can't even come to the end of the year and figure out how to move forward until they know what that tax is gonna be. So, yeah, it's, it's on the table. If we do what we just, uh, what, what the governor vetoed, it'll help, but now we'll look at the November forecast, see where we're, where we're sitting, and maybe make some changes in that too, but it has to be done immediately. Great, thank you. For our next question, we'll start with Michael, followed by Karen. As a legislator, what plans will you advance to increase housing for lower income and homeless people? What plans will you advance to increase housing for lower income or even homeless people? Michael. Um, well, I know one of the things that we utilize in the tribes is, uh, is a block grants. Um, so block grants are, are uh, monies that are set aside uh, specifically for housing issues in general. Um, I think that's something that we can mirror and mimic. And on top of that, um, I think we need to provide better incentives for developers and by um, by bringing in uh, folks that are that are interested in reducing the cost of, of um, home construction and home ownership, and um, having those experts, you know, um, be uh, advocates and guides for the legislature, um, so that everybody within the legislature understands where the stuff is coming from, why it is the way it is, what are these increases, and why do they mean what they mean. Um, and, then, and then once we get a handle on that, we can all work together on figuring out how to reduce those kinds of costs. Thank you. Karen, followed by Steve. Our housing issue is, is pretty much twofold. It's can people afford to buy or build housing and are there, is there housing available? So you have some places where um, housing isn't available. That's a different issue than whether or not people can afford to buy a home. So the solutions to this are going to be varied. 
Um, one of the issues that I think a lot of people have brought up to me as I've been door knocking is livable wage, and they've linked that to their ability to buy a home or not. And so we need to take a serious look at what is a livable wage in our communities, what does that look like, and how do we make that happen for people? Because I know we have some jobs available, but a lot of those jobs aren't a livable wage. They're not <coughs> going to pay people enough for them to build a home or buy a home, or even fix up an older home. So I think that's one of the biggest things to do about housing. For housing availability, we should have a smoother process to building because building in our communities is gonna be jobs and is gonna build that economy, so. Thank you, Steve. Listening to all these, uh, these guys talking about uh, uh, easing up on building regulations, boy, it sounds like uh, I'm in the right place because that's one thing that we really need to do is ease up on regulations and some of the requirements. But I think that the key uh, to any anything here, whether it's low income or homelessness, is getting people to work. Uh, we have had some proposals for the welfare to work, and which means that if you if you are on welfare, instead of saying if you make a certain amount, we're just going to whack you off right there and you're done, and it's, it, it doesn't make it profitable for you to keep working, you might not be able to have enough to pay for that. Instead, I have some proposals if I can get them through to to allow steps so that so that as we can work people off of the system and allow them to, to build and buy their own homes. And I think that's the key. We have the jobs now. We have more jobs than we have people. And we've already talked about the technical training. That's part of it. And so we're gonna move, you know, we'll just move into this. And we'll start at the younger ages and, and move, our, move ourselves up. But, but nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Blame Luann, not me. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Matt. When you come to, when you, when you talk about uh, what can we do for housing, you know, we've got to, like Steve said,